So the talk of today is, is uh, the title is linking dimensionality to computation in neural networks. And do uh, you see my screen okay? Is everything fine in your end? Cool. Uh, so what the big picture behind this kind of works is, is actually has to do with what I call the geometry of neural representations. And uh, what does it mean geometry? I hope it will be clear as we go, but there is a, a pile of work that is accumulating in the field. Uh, and there are major players that are way better than myself. Uh, like there is great work coming out of the lab of Byron Yu or Stefano Fusi and they really work that like the work that recently uh, Cengiz Pelevan and Mikhe Ceklovsky have been doing. And, and there is more and more work coming out on, on hypotheses that they would term geometry of the representation. Initially, they were going under, under the word of manifold uh, that we you all heard, right? And, and now I think they're accumulating into something more and uh, more theoretical and more sophisticated. So this talk today is, is one of these classes. Uh, that falls in this class. And what we will do today is to, to look at this word and link it to the word learning and to the idea of behavior uh, and see how the geometry of representation is linked to both learning and behavior in specific cases. So to set up my talk, I want to set up a, a specific question, a dichotomy actually. Um, so let's start with the idea of asking ourselves how complex is neural activity? Well, recently, there have been a couple of studies, very influential, I think, from the lab of Carantini and Darius that were published here, where they studied a lot of neurons. Here, what you see on, on this figure is the activity of 10,000 neurons simultaneously recorded over the, the course of time. They nicely arranged these neurons to show uh, how the pr first principal component, here depicted in, in purple, is very much aligned with behavioral components such as running, pupillary, and whisking. And what the authors say, like out of this study, what they conclude in writing the abstract is that recording more than 10,000 neurons in mouse visual cortex, we observe that spontaneous activity reliably encoded a high dimensional latent state, which was partially related to the mouse's ongoing behavior and was represented not just in visual cortex, but across the brain. So by analyzing so many neurons in uh, visual cortex, the authors concluded that there was a high dimensional feature, that the data were very complex. On the other hand, uh, from the lab of Surya Ganguly, there has been a, a review recently, a very nice one, of many different studies, and where they also studied the dimensionality of neural activity. And what they concluded was the ubiquity of low dimensionality. And so when I look at this picture and uh, talking with many people, uh, I think this is a dichotomy that is really coming up in the field is what is low dimensional, what is high dimensional is not clear. Many of us look at neural activity and conclude that is actually there are low dimensional features. And many others look at neural activity and say it's very high dimensional. We have so many neurons and it's very co complex. It must be high dimensional. Uh, so uh, to, there are simple considerations that can be done to resolve this dichotomy. Maybe sensory areas are of one kind and motor generation areas are, are low dimensional. And uh, there are many, many different considerations. But still, this dichotomy is very present in the field. Uh, so I put forward this hypothesis, and I will clarify it shortly, uh, de defining well what we what we are saying about dimensionality and so on. And then I will link it to learning, and we show I show how we can build representation that are efficient from this dimensionality perspective, and link it also to behavior, uh, more specifically to behavior that has some features of naturalistic behavior. So these are the three parts that I'm going through today. Okay, let's start with the definition of dimensionality. Uh, there are many definitions that have been studying this topic for a while now. It's quite uh, interesting. But here is an operative definition. Consider an experimental setting and where an animal, such as a mouse, is provided with some stimuli. Uh, 
right? For example, drifting gratings, a, a traditional one. And this would be termed an evoked condition in, in a sensory cortex like visual cortex. Then suppose that you are recording from the brain with probes, right? Like here, what you see is neuropixel probes that are injected in, that are uh, lowered in the animal's brain from the visual cortex sitting hippocampus, thalamus, and other areas. So when you look at the recordings, they look like this. You have a lot of neurons, right, here. And roughly what I'm displaying here is two minutes of the activity of these neurons across these regions. Well, these, these are many different, like, very high dimensional recordings. These are, we're talking about thousands of neurons. And what theoretical people like me um, are faced with the challenge of understanding these data. So it's the first thing, the very first thing we do, right, is to pick up a window of time, say 100 milliseconds, count the spikes in each of these windows and create what we call spike count vectors. Now, these are vectors, right, uh, that are linked to a specific moment in time of the neural activity. And then each of these points, right, each of these vectors is a, is a point in the high dimensional space of the neurons. Uh, so this neural activity is now a point, what we often term a point cloud, right? And each point is this spike count vector. Now, what I drew here as well uh, are these axes, right? What these axes are, we all know, are the axes that are the eigenvectors of the covariant matrix of the neural activity that I just portrayed and the related eigenvalues that capture the variability along these axes. Now, if I want to understand what is the dimensionality of this neural code, one way to do it is to use the following measure. First, you, we normalize all the eigenvalues to their sum, to the total variance in the, in the system, in the recordings. And then we take this measure, which is one over the sum of the square of each individual values. This goes also under the name of participation ratio. And what is this metric may not be intuitive at first, but is very strongly correlated with something that we often do. That is, we count the number of eigenvalues that we need in order to reach the 90% of, of the variability in the data of the total variance. Although it's strongly correlated with this more empirical measure of threshold in the eigenvalues, there is a very simple way of understanding uh, what it does. And it, it's essentially a measure of skewness, if you like. If you take a distribution that is completely isotropic, here what it, it is a Gaussian distribution in three dimensions, then the free eigenvalues would be the same. And the dimensionality in turn would be free. You can simply plug in these values to, to see that. On the other hand, if I stretch this distribution along one of the axes, one of the eigenvalues would be prominent and the other two would be smaller. And plugging in these values, you will see that this is roughly dimensionality of 1.1. So what this metric is really capturing is first building a Gaussian enveloping of your cloud, some sort of an ellipsoid, and then measuring its skewness uh, weighting all the, the different eigenvalues of the covariance. And this metric was uh, brought to neuroscience from Larry Abbott and then studied in a number of works and has been proven to be very uh, efficient in, in many ways. Okay, so what can we do with this? This is just one metric, but we can ask with this how many dimensions, right, do spike responses fill up? We can ask all sorts of theoretical questions because it's essentially a, a easy theoretical measure that is computable. I, I'll show that later. But first, I think we should really ask, why should we do this? Who cares? Why is this interesting at all? Why are we studying the dimensionality and not something else? Are we wasting our time? Well, I hope that I will convince you that it's not the case, that this is interesting. And I think it's interesting for different, from different perspective. For example, if the dimensionality of neural activity is low, then uh, low dimensionality has been associated with a number of good things like the noising or the coding from QR cells. But I think the most important is really the fact that a low dimensional code is something that generalizes more. On the other hand, a high dimensional code has been associated with the fact that you can decode 
more simply information from it. For example, each of these points here can be thought as being separable from all the others with a, a linear hypermap. That is a feature of the code. So it seems that if you want both generalization and good decoding properties, you need to live in the middle. And what we term in our lab, uh, some sort of Goldilocks dimensionality hypothesis, where you can both classify information well and also have good generalization properties. But how can you really draw from both sides uh, the, the low and high hypothesis at once? Well, here is one way. And uh, that I, I'm going to go through today. And this is the, the possibility that actually neural activity is locally low, but globally high dimensional. And I'm going to explain very in detail what this means. It's an hypothesis. Uh, it hasn't been proven yet. And if you have any work that relates to this, please send it my way. We, we are considering writing a review on, on similar ideas. OK. So here I'm going to show now the hypothesis of being locally low dimensional and globally high dimensional in two specific setups, one the continuous and one the discrete case. So here what you see is a two dimensional plane, right? Like a floor that has been navigated or explored by an agent or an animal like myself walking in my room. Uh, for, the, for the sake of clarity, I colored each tile of this floor with a different color, right? So that we can keep track of it. Now, if my neural space was to encode this, uh, this space linearly, then I would simply find that each location of the space would correspond to a single point in my, in my neural activity, in my brain. This is my, my rep the representation in a brain area. Uh, but, if it is fully linear, this means that also the neurons will be correlated in a way that is both locally and globally. It's all linear, right? It's just a, a, a paper. On the other hand, if I was to embed this thing in high dimension, each point could be, could be put in a different spot of, of, my, of my neural activity. And this is not even a continuous manifold, right? But because it's not continuous, I'm filling up uh, both locally and globally all the space. So both locally and globally, I'm high dimensional. The entire space is filled up. On the other hand, a simple hypothesis is, as I said, that you're locally low dimensional, but globally high. And what this picture is, is simply uh, taking the, this manifold, this initial linear manifold, and curving it in such a way that it expands all, all over the places in all dimensions of the neural activity. So that locally in each neighborhood of this manifold, the tangent space is simply two dimensional, right? It's a one to one mapping. So it's two dimensional locally, but globally it's taking up all the, all the neural space. And this is again, is good because locally you can generalize. It's clear that the picture on, that I put forward on the right, there is no neighborhood information, right? But here there is. And on the other hand, this manifold is still separable. Each point uh, can be decoded uh, with linear hyperplanes. So this is my hypothesis. I will show uh, these both in, learn in learning. But I will use then the discrete case of this hypothesis for behavior to show that there are correlates in behavior. So if you select just a few points out of, of the previous case, uh, then we can analyze the behavior of animals in the following way. Uh, we, uh, each action of the animal can be considered as a different behavior. And I color it according to, to its identity. And the only thing that is left is the duration. And we will see, I will show how these two, the identity and the duration are linked to specific dimensional properties of the code. But again, these points can be embedded in low dimension with a dynamic that I will define, in high dimension, similar to what I did before, what I said before, or in, as I mentioned before, they can be embedded in, in a space that is high dimensional from a global perspective, but locally, these points have low dimensional properties. What this, does it mean for these points to be locally low dimensional? It means that 
if you zoom in into each of these points, the geometrical properties of this point are low D. And what the operative definition of these is linked to the property of noise correlations or a trial to trial variability. I will be very, very, very clear later on. Uh, so this is just to put forward an hypothesis, a working hypothesis that I'm gonna use through the talk. So this was stage one. Let's move forward. Uh, okay, let's look into learning. I will use specifically predictive coding, predictive temporal learning to show that predictive temporal learning leads to this kind of representation. And that's gonna be the punchline for my, for the second part of my talk. Uh, to start with though, I, I need to, to do some, to build more of your intuition. Uh, so let's do a simple exercise again. Let's take again our, our two dimensional space, our floor and consider place cells, uh, meaning neurons or cells that have a Gaussian tuning for simplicity in each of this, in each place of this two dimensional space uh, that can be identified with coordinate X and Y. Each neuron, and there, there is a neuron for each location in this space, is centered along a different uh, on a different location and there's a specific uh, width, a specific Gaussian width. If now I, I imagine myself walking in this room, right? And over the course of time, being in all the places of this room, then I can keep track of all the points in, in my, in, in, if I were to record in a specific brain area that has this coding and the representation of all these points that are one to in one to one relationship because of this coding to the environment, to the room, will be looking like this. It's actually the, the same, the very same picture I used before. That's how I generated it. This is a manifold that has been generated for a Gaussian coding uh, on a two dimensional surface. And what you can do on, on this manifold is even to, to plot, if you like, your receptive fields and see how they look like on the manifold directly. It's a bit of a mental exercise. It doesn't come natural at first, but it's important. It says that maybe um, receptive fields are not to be considered such on the environment, but directly on the manifold. And there is a lot of work on this now. Uh, Mikhail Chuklovsky, David Tank, and others have been working on this. Uh, using the same coloring that I presented before, that has, is actually clear, maybe, where I, I colored according to the tile of the environment, you can see how each of these points on the two-dimensional environment is mapped through this one-to-one -one relationship on the manifold, right? Each point has a one-to-one -one relationship due to my Gaussian phase field coding. I can even track, in this case, the trajectory, my trajectory in the environment, but, but on the manifold. So what are the dimensional properties that I highlighted before of this guy, right? Uh, of this neural code? Well, it is a one-to-one -one map, right? So locally, again, the tangent space is two-dimensional, but globally, what it depends on is actually the width of this Gaussian field. So if you are to plot the dimensionality, as I defined it before, as a function of the Gaussian field, the sigma width, the variance of the Gaussian field, if it's clear that if it is small, uh, the neurons will be more decorrelated, meaning more asynchronous, and the dimensionality will be higher. So we'll be here. But if the Gaussian field is high, the dimensionality will be lower, right? According to this relationship. What actually happens is that in a simple equation, if you take the ratio between global dimensionality and local dimensionality, the global dimensionality is proportional to one over sigma squared. And the local dimensionality is always two. So what we term dimensionality gain, and that is this ratio, so dimensionality gain, BG, if you like, is simply the ratio between the lock, global and local thing. And in this case, it's a property that is leveraged by the Gaussian uh, field of your neurons. So what does this have to do with learning? Well, bear with me for a second. Uh, let's consider an experiment, a similar one, 
Let's take an agent navigating a room again, but this time we, we provide the agent with a, a set of sensors. So we, this agent is gifted, if you like, uh, with the ability of seeing visual information from the walls that are colored in a random fashion, as you can see here. Uh, the agent has a 90 degree uh, visual field. So we we'll term these observations and we think of these observations together with the actions that the agent takes in an allocentric system of reference. We use both observations and actions to train a recurrent neural network and we task the network to output the prediction of the next observation. So we want its output to be O of T plus one. So while this is O, the observation at the current time, this needs to be the observation in the next step. Uh, we, we train this network with, uh, with back propagation through time and stochastic gradient descent, so machine learning techniques. Um, and what we realized upon training this network is that the neurons in this network develop fields like the ones that I just mentioned that are kind of alike place fields meaning that the activity of, of many different neurons um, was localized in space, in the space navigated by the agent. Now, as I just mentioned, a uh, representation of this kind seems to have the property of being locally low dimensional and globally high dimensional. But first, before showing that, uh, we need to check that this is indeed a predictive representation that is not just encoding things randomly. One way to check that the predictive task on the network is essential for this representation is, is simple. Is actually, let's change the task. Let's ask the network to autoencode the observation so that y of t now is equals to, to the same observation given in input and see what kind of representation does my network develop. And in this case, we, we actually don't see any localization in space. And this is not a proof, this is just uh, to show that if you relax the predictive demand on the network, you don't see place cells. So, but the question is why, right? Why, what is happening in the network that displays this localized activity? Well, as I said, first we need to make sure that the network does predictive coding and not something else. One way to do that, to make sure of that, is to, to do a decoding, um, analysis. So from each moment in time, as we, we term it zero in the neural representation, we try to decode the past and the future of the location of the agent, the location in terms of the coordinates x and y, or the angle theta. Now, if you do the decoding curve in this case, as a function of delta t of the time, you realize that the symmetry of this curve is skewed towards the future. Your optimal decoder is for the next step because we task the network to do so. The good thing about this is that this analysis doesn't rely on any information that actually, that doesn't rely on, on much knowledge of the network. And what I mean with that is that you can export this analysis even to the brain. So for example, we, we analyze data from the hippocampus recording in Buzaki lab. And we, we saw that actually this kind of metric exports very well, meaning that if you run the same anal decoding analysis, also in the hippocampus, it is true that your best decoding ability of space is skewed towards the future of roughly 100 milliseconds. So this idea is good because it exports to neuroscience very naturally. But I'm not saying that the hippocampus is predictive. I'm not, I can't conclude that from here because there could be a lot of phenomena that build into this. For example, replay, replay, and uh, theta, theta rhythm that could go in influence in this picture. But sure, there is some information regarding the future of my position. Going back to why uh, this representation build in such a way, uh, the reason we believe is the following is, and there, there are more analysis in the paper that show that this is the case, that over the course of learning, what's, what happens is that the local dimensionality goes actually down 
while, and this seems to be a prediction effect, meaning that the predictive demand on the network drives the demand, the, the, the local dimensionality of the representation to be low. On the other hand, the global dimensionality of my representation goes up. And this seems to be linked to the sensor demand, meaning that the fact that the network needs to reproduce um, the visual features of the wall and reproduce all of these high dimensional features. So if you are to increase the sensory demand, you would, we see that it correlates with the dimension, global dimensionality of the representation. So all in all, what happens is that uh, this ratio keeps increasing through learning. And there is, there is very nice work uh, from different people that, uh, for example, the lab of David Tank applied these ideas to the hippocampus, extracting the, the manifold. Joran Burak we, we also work on this, but there is a very nice paper from the lab of uh, Chuklowski uh, from St. Gupta, localized receptive fields on the manifold that show similar effects on the manifold and of neural activity. I'm, so I wouldn't, the, the crucial bit here is that I am, wouldn't put forward this hypothesis if, I, if we didn't have other uh, ideas from the, big, from the big picture, called big picture, the other word that we did. So we noticed that actually it's, it, these phenomena of low, extracting and regularizing the dimensionality of the manifold are very important in different setups. Uh, a different setup in which this showed up very clearly uh, was not in these predictive learning mechanisms, but rather in deep neural network uh, trained to classify Im images. What we see in these networks is that the dimensionality first goes up, and here you see a few spikes due to the values nonlinearities, and then it goes down. And the fact that it goes down uh, is an effect that we link to the regularizing effect of SGD of stochastic gradient descent. So that there is a compression, if you want a local compression of my manifold. I have a video quickly to show uh, how to picture it and make sense of this dimensionality expansion and compression. So let me see if it plays. One second, I will explain as soon as I get to the right mark. Okay, so what you see here is the MNIS data set, the data set of digits, before it is inputted to the network. Now, what you will see is that you can keep track of the color of these clouds. I apologize if the resolution is not as good, but I hope you see different colors here. And what you will see is how these clouds are first expanded in their dimensionality through different layers of the network and then compressed. Let's have a look together. This is the data set. And here is the first layer. Users are first expanded. Here already in layer two days, these classes are brought forward and out of the cloud. And this is a dimensionality expansion phenomena. See how these classes are compressed and So at the last layer, these classes are, are simply high dimensional, I have a high dimensional arrangement and they're being squeezed down to a single point. So their local dimensionality is the dimensionality of a point, which technically is zero because a point has dimensionality zero while a line would be dimensionality one. But their global arrangement has high dimensionality so that they can be decoded easily. Uh, Another bit of information, it's a paper that we just put on the archive, uh, is the following. Uh, here in this paper, we analyze the scale dependent dimensionality of neural activity. And we put forward theory to make this assessment. Uh, we analyze neuropixel data. And we, we, what you see here is the dimensionality of 100 neurons simultaneously recorded with neuropixel in different conditions engage a two force decision make alternative decision making task and the spontaneous activity in areas which are involved in decision making we have more areas in the paper this is just to make a quick point so 
different eyes have a clear difference in their dimensionality and a clear modulation over different scales. Interestingly, we hope to find that the dimensionality of these areas would be locally low at smaller scales and globally high, but we instead we found that we were not statistically significant in this region, but many different sessions, especially in frontal cortex and hippocampus, seem to go lower at lower scales. So the, we'll have this work for the future eventually to show that indeed at local scales, the dimensionality is lower than a global scale. But what we did find very clearly is that the dimensionality is modulated at different scales and possibly different areas are more separated at local scales rather than global. Also, this kind of analysis is important to show that different conditions like the engaged spontaneous have different dimensionality, so different manifold geometrical properties. What you see here is that the dimensionality difference in frontal cortex and midbrain is significantly different. Uh, if I take the difference between the dimensionality during the engaged condition minus the, the dimensionality during spontaneous condition. And as you see, it's lower than zero, showing that during engaged, the dimensionality is lower. And so these are just, just to highlight some phenomena that you can see in data and how it, it relates to this hypothesis. But the punchline of this second session is really something simpler than all these that I added in the end is the following, is that temporal prediction in neural circuits extracts a low dimensional latent manifold. I didn't show that actions are essential for these, the encoding of action, and matches sensory demands with a high dimensional organization. So this is my local property, and this is my global property. And uh, well, I switch slide to global. So in one sentence, the conclusion can be termed as follows. Predictive learning enables the generation of locally low and globally high dimensional representations. And we have much more theory uh, in this paper that is now set in the nature of communication and was a joint uh, work. It was a work that is co-led by Mattia and Derek. Okay, uh, on to the, uh, to the third and last part of my talk. That has to do with behavior. Uh, so the, the second part was a, just a, a proof of concept of why learning has to deal with these hypotheses of regularizing my manifold and making it locally low dimensional. But now I will show that also behavior exploits or can exploit at least uh, these uh, geometrical feature, features. So the, this part uh, goes as follows. So let's go back to the discrete hypothesis that I mentioned and, and consider different states. Uh, then what I mentioned before is that there are different ways in which these states can be embedded in your representations. And I argue that there is a way to embed them in a similar fashion that is locally low dimensional and globally high. Uh, so I will argue that the correspondence between these states and behavior and this is the following. We will simplify behavior as much as we can. We are theorists, and that's what I hope what we're good at, uh, simplifying things so that we can make theory out of it. So here is a way to capture important traits of, of natural behavior. If you look at the animal, you'll see that there is a repertoire of many different behaviors that it can accomplish. And each time it takes an action, this action is drawn from by this high dimensional repertoire of many different possibilities. For example, a rearing or diving or moving. And if you were to, as I mentioned before, simply identify the state of the animal from this repertoire, you were to give it a color, say blue, purple, green, and so on. And it becomes a strip where the only two things of this strip that really matters are the identity of the behavior and the duration of the behavior. The longer it is, uh, the longer it, it is the associated color in the strip. So there are only two elements, right, to build this parsing of behavioral states, the identity and the duration. Now, as for the identity, uh, this appears from other studies, to, for example, the, the work of, out of the data lab, is that we termed it lexical variability of naturalistic behavior, because, and it seems to be uh, high dimensional in the sense that there are many, maybe hundreds of this behavior, and they're all distinct, right? 
that it's kind of jumping from one to the other if you look at the animal. So that a way to make sense of it is really a lexical metaphor. There are actions on the order of 100 milliseconds, then you switch suddenly, and on the order of a second, you build what we could term words, and eventually you build these things into plan, right? On the order of a minute. But this is kind of a, a jump, right? Between different uh, states. On the other hand, right? It, the cool thing is that whenever we do this, we jump from one state to the other, or the animal does it, uh, it can control the temporal variability, the duration of these states. And what I will show is that this temporal variability has a locally low dimensional counterpart in the neural code. But this will be coming uh, to the end of, my, uh, of this section of the talk. So the temporal variability, the temporal duration of each of these states is distributed in a very skewed way. If I look at the state duration there, are, at times these actions are very short, at times they're very long. And this is a work that I did uh, with uh, Luca Mazzucato, which uh, recently talked, and I think uh, mentioned different aspects of this work and that, that I'm here gonna take from a diff very different angle. So uh, the idea that I wanted to have in mind is that this lexical variability translates in different states and then this temporal variability is really the, about the geometrical properties of how you get out of each of this state and, and you flow to the next one. I'll be clear in just a few slides. Okay. So we need an experiment, right? If you want to prove that these ideas have to do with neural data, we need a clear experiment that can disentangle these two sources of variability, lexical and temporal. Uh, so he, a way to do it is to have a fixed sequence of actions, but variable transition times. Now, what, what is the experiment that can achieve this? Well, it's, it's a, you need tricky experiments to do this, and very smart ones. And this was performed in the, in the lab of Zachary Minen, uh, which collided this work. So for the sake of my talk, the only important thing that you need uh, to bear in mind is that there are three actions that always happen in every trial. The poking of the animal, correct? The poke out of the same animal, and the water poking. There are also three events which we couldn't be decoded from the neural activity. So they're less relevant for the sake of my talk, but they're very relevant for, uh, for the behavior of, of the animal. So the tone, the first tone, the second tone, and the reward. Now, the important part is that I will explain the task and show you the video in a second, but the important part is that if in each trial in one session, you align in time the, to the pokin of the animal and you look at the, at the onset of the poke out or the water pokin that are here colored in every trial with dots, you see that the, the variability, the temporal variability of this transition is very high. It can last up hundreds of milliseconds or, or several seconds. On the other hand, the sequence of action was stereotypical across each trial. So it did happen that we are in this regime with a fixed sequence of action, but variable transition time. So in each trial, I will now explain in detail what happens in each trial. The animal pokes into the top port, that is term waiting port, and then here's a first tone, and then has a decision to take, either to wait for the second tone or to poke out, but independently whether it's waiting or not. If the animal pokes out, then pokes in into the second port and gets a delivery, a water delivery, which is bigger, double in size, if he waited for the second tone. Uh, to show a couple of trials to, to have an idea of what this experiment is about. Um, you can keep track in the video of the pokin with this symbol and in green, a light green and dark green, you see the appearance of first and second tone and then the water delivery in purple. Uh, so here the animal is poking into the light, which is the waiting port. So it, this is the pokin action. Here is the first tone in light green second tone and then the water reward as it pokes into the second port. Poke in 
reward. Another trial, poke in, poke out and reward. Is this the typical movement of the action of the animal? Okay, so recordings were performed. Uh, recordings were performed in, in the secondary motor cortex. And, and there were 12 or 20 neurons at the time that were simultaneously recorded across sessions. And the one trial looks like this. And what I'm displaying here is the result of a unsupervised mechanism that is a, the feat of a hidden Markov model that extracts only from the neural activity the states. States that are in the neural activity and which I show that they correlate with behavior, but they haven't used for this feed any knowledge of the behavior itself. What you see is that the, each line is the probability of the posterior probability of the neural activity being found in such state. If I have to, if I am to look across all trials in one session and I time, time warp such trials so to align to the three actions that are in the task, the pokin, the pokat, and the water pokin, I see that some states always appear right before the specific action undertaken by the animal, which means that my unsupervised method, knowing nothing about behavior, extracted from the neural activity an antecedent of behavior. Uh, this, in this case, is true for both the red and purple state. But if here are many more sessions, and I hope where I color the states as I could tag them according to specific action. And I hope you can appreciate that this is not just the case of a specific session, but it worked well across all, all recorded sessions. A way uh, that we have in the, in the manuscript to show that this works very well is to train a dictionary to decode the upcoming behavior from uh, the actions, uh, from the tagged states. So we have a decoding analysis that we show, but we show that we can uh, decode the upcoming behavior from the supervised method. So uh, this is just analysis, right? Uh, um, an experimental analysis, but it's important because it allowed us to control what I termed before lexical variability. Now we have a complete one-to-one -one map between behavior and neural activity established in an unsupervised way. This allowed us uh, to probe what we really wanted, the temporal variability in the neural code. So what is the temporal variability in the neural code? To go into this second question, uh, we build a model, a neural network model. And here I will leverage your intuition of attractor neural networks. So in, we build a model where we use attractors and we chain different attractors into according to sequence terms, where an attractor new was chained with the next one. So to build a sequence. In the tradition, in the best tradition of theoretical neuroscience, many people have worked over these sequence generation problems in attractor networks over the years. But the intuition behind this network, I, I find it uh, both simple and challenging at times, depending on the phenomena. Here is the simple part. Uh, the attractor term builds wells of potential in the energy landscape of my network, so we know that a steady state of my network is find, found in a minima of my energy landscape that is written into my equations through this term. On the other hand, the sequence term is to lower the energy barriers between two uh, minima in my energy landscape, so that if I am to perturb my system, I will flow from one to the next state. The question is, where is the system? The system can generate, depending on the strength of one or the other term in the phase plane here showed, uh, sequences, background, or attractors, steady states. In the sequence regime, that is the one interesting for our case, we have the appearance of different states in a stereotypical fashion. So they always appear and go, but the duration of these states is always the same. There is no variability. If we try, and here is the less direct uh, step of the analysis. If you try to stretch the temporal variability of these models, actually, you find that it's hard and counterintuitive. So by injecting, for example, tribal noise in the equations, you'll see that the trials are still very stereotypical and the well time duration of each state is always the same, it's a delta. There is no temporal variability. You have fixed sequence generation, but zero temporal variability. 
what you find is that this is not working because this noise is high dimensional, each private to each neuron, and so it's pushing the neural activity in all sorts of directions. So that if you are too average, its effect is always too little or too high uh, due to phenomena that are often termed course of dimensionality. And they occur simply because they're unintuitive and they appear when you don't want to, like in this case. But if you are to fix this problem and you, insert, you want to insert temporal variability, what you find is that you need a dimensional term. And this is in ca the case of a single one dimensional null orstein ullenberg process. So you, in this way, if you add this low dimensional correlated noise, then the transition, the neural activity is pushed in different direction, but along the low dimensional manifold, and you recover actually the temporal variability that, that we wanted. So in this case, the model generate fixed sequences of states, but the temporal variability that is being generated for each state is actually high. Different states, like the red one here, can last, you know, can have very different durations across all trials that are captured by these long skewed distributions. And these match the data very, very well. So this appears to be in total agreement with the data. So there were two predictions coming out of this model. One is that the dimensionality of each state is low. I will show this clearly in the next slide. And the next one that I'll leave for you to look up in the paper, if you like, is that the, we found that also the, the noise correlation were aligned across states, meaning that each state was a bit skewed towards the next one. And we control for several things, and these appear to be a, a, a strong feature of the data. So, but for the low dimensionality of each state, here is how you can probe it and how we did it. If you look at the average firing rate of each state appearing in each trial, then you can embed each of these average firing rate as a point in the, in the neural space here represented through the principal components. And what this feature is about is the fact that the trial to trial or noise correlations variability is low dimensional for each of these states. So for each of, each of these point cloud, color in different ways, as a low dimensionality in its trial to trial variability. And this low dimensionality, as we showed in the model, is the key feature for temporal variability. And, and we show in the paper its control. Uh, so the data appear to be low dimensional and very strong agreement with the model, if you look at the dimensionality. And performing any sorts of shuffle on the, or the model, we found that this was lower dimensional than you would expect. So what we did, what we found is that the code was in, as in, had indeed a low dimensional local correlated variability, local in terms of uh, noise correlations as compared to different states. And we know that, that while this is bad, if you want for sensory processing, it's good for motor generation and the control of timing. And here is a paper that shows this. So all in all, the, the bottom line of this part of the talk is that there are two parts to this simple picture of behavior. One is the identity of the states, that is this high dimensional feature that are embedded in high dimension. But the second is that uh, the duration of the states is linked to the low dimensionality of the way these, uh, these states are embedded in your representation. So to conclude this uh, third part of my talk, and that leads me to the uh, overall conclusion, uh, I can say the following, that temporal variability in complex behavior requires a locally low dimensional component in a globally high scenario of naturalistic behavior. And the one liner is temporal variability in complex naturalistic behavior exploits the low high dimensional properties of new representations. And this work is under revision in nature neuroscience and was collided by Luke and John. Okay, so there are other, um, I don't know how much time I have. I see that is getting late uh, quickly, very quickly, a, a couple of one slider. Uh, so we found that uh, these phenomena of uh, dimensionality expansion and reduction are, and locally low and globally high perspective, uh, at counterparts in other data analysis, in the pixel data analysis that we found. For example, the, what I highlighted before, these expansion and compression in deep neural networks uh, we found that there was also an expansion 
in the visual hierarchy recently identified uh, by the Allen Institute. Uh, and this is important because it shows that the visual hierarchy might actually bring out and expand the neural representation. And it may establish what we still don't know if it is a real link between the expansion along the visual stream and the expansion of uh, deep neural network. Uh, then we, we have a, a recent uh, paper, this one, top one, uh, with David Damon and Colette by Mo Elias Moritz, where we build a lot of theory to show that uh, the local dimensionality that I've been talking about could be might be controlled in neural circuits by local connectivity features, such as second order motifs, reciprocal convergent divergent synaptic motifs. And we computed the, the radius or the overall recurrences of the system as a function of this local feature and showing that um, the recurrences that are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the dimensionality of the system, I don't have time to show it, uh, seem to push uh, towards a more strongly recurrent uh, um, regime, both in mouse and human, that means in turn that they tend to lower the dimensionality of the system. So they're also in agreement with this perspective. And, his work was collided by Eric and Moritz. And finally, I have work in my PhD that shows this. So, but the punchline and real message that I, you see I wanted to convey today is that the initial dichotomy that I put forward is high dimensional, maybe sensory processing and low dimensional perspective coming from many different data analysis might be resolved if we simply open up a number of hypotheses, uh, which are very intriguing and nice, and they seem to work well. For example, the one that I mentioned today, that the code might be simply locally low dimensional and globally high dimensional. And what I showed today uh, as it can be simply said in two parts. One is that predictive learning generates such locally low and globally high representations, and that temporal variability in behavior ex uh, exploits this locally low uh, dimensionality of, neural, or of the neural code. Uh, I was advised over the, the course of the years by, by different people that I really want to thank you as I conclude my talk, as I want to thank you for your attention. The work showed here was, co -led, by, uh, was led by Eric and Luca, but many other people were involved, uh, Zach, uh, Mattia, and Moritz, uh, and also DJ and Nick, our first authors in, in this publication, our uh, joint last authors in these publications. And, um, and I hope that you, you found this hypothesis intriguing. And, and I hope that you can come back to me, send me an email, and say, you're wrong, you're right. Look at this paper, look at that paper, as we may consider writing a review about these and other ideas. Um, please uh, have a look at, at these publications if you found them interesting. What I talked about can be found in these two papers, but recently we uploaded uh, two more theoretical papers uh, that build theory uh, for all what I said and hopefully will lead us to the next beat in this talk. Thank you all for your attention.